second reading of Bill C-219. Mr. Nader, seconded by Mr. Schmalley, moves that Bill C-219, an act to amend the criminal code, sexual exploitation, be now read a second time and referred to the Standing Committee on Justice and Human Rights. Debate. The Honorable Member... What for? <laughs> Bert Wellington. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Madam Speaker, and it is indeed an honour to represent the good people of Perth Wellington here in this place. Uh, it is an honour to rise in the House this afternoon to begin second reading debate of my private member's bill, known in this Parliament as Bill C-219, an act to amend the Criminal Code Sexual Exploitation. As I stated when I introduced this bill at first reading, it is a direct result of the advocacy, comments, concerns of the people of Perth Wellington. In early 2018, an incident occurred in which a person employed to work with persons with disabilities, who was also a children's entertainer, was convicted of a serious sexual crime against a person living with disabilities. My constituents were outraged by the lenient sentence of a monetary fine and probation and called for a resolution to the flaw in the criminal code. Madam Speaker, I would say at the outset that in a perfect world, I would have liked to have done so much more through this bill to better support Canadians living with disabilities. Far too often I hear from constituents who live with disabilities that they have fallen through the cracks. Those who have experienced challenges in accessing government programs, those who face challenges with housing, and those who encounter barriers in employment. However, as honourable members know, with the limitations of private members' business, it would not be possible to achieve all of these goals through legislation without a royal recommendation. In his 1913 biography, autobiography, Theodore Roosevelt includes this quotation, do what you can with what you've got, where you are. So I'm here today in this house, doing what I can with the legislat legislative resources available to me to try in this way to better protect Canadians living with disabilities. I originally introduced this legislation in the previous parliament in January of 2019 as Bill C. 424. However, as members know, the standing orders on private members' business were a barrier to moving this bill forward at the time, and it died on the order paper when the 42nd Parliament was dissolved. During the 2019 election, the proposals contained in my bill were included as part of the Conservative Party's election platform, and I personally made the commitment to my constituents that if I were to be re-elected, I would bring back this legislation to this House. Today, I'm fulfilling that commitment to the constituents of Perth Wellington. Shortly after I tabled this bill for the second time, in February 2020, another case involving sexual exploitation reached the news. This case involved a young person. The former chief of police of Bridgewater, Nova Scotia, was sentenced to a 15-month imprisonment following an October 2019 conviction for sexually exploiting a 17-year-old girl. In this instance, the offender was also convicted of sexual assault. However, this caused a legal issue as it was questioned as to whether the court could convict a guilty person of two criminal offences for the same incident. In this case, the conviction of sexual exploitation was entered and the conviction of sexual assault was stayed. As a sexual exploitation charge is often accompanied by a sexual assault charge, Bill C-219 would provide the additional benefit of ensuring only fair sentences are available when such controversies occur. Furthermore, Bill C-219 proposes to provide courts with the ability to impose harsher sentences in instances when only a charge of sexual exploitation is made. One example of the convictions of sexual exploitation but not sexual assault occurred last year, also in Nova Scotia, in which a religious leader was convicted of sexually exploiting a 17-year-old young person. The second proposal contained within Bill C-219 was also inspired by the incident that occurred in my riding. If passed, this bill would require courts to consider the fact that a victim is a person living with a physical or mental disability as an aggravating circumstance when sentencing a person convicted under Section 286.1 sub 1 or 286.1 sub 2 of the Criminal Code. This would fill an unfortunate void currently existing in the Criminal Code. Persons living with disabilities are more vulnerable to this kind of exploitation due to a number of factors, including the capacity to give consent. What is more, in many cases, the offender is known to the victim 
and is often someone the victim must rely upon for care or other personal or financial support. This addition to the criminal code would ensure courts always take into account this vulnerability. It is a sad truth, but as legislators, we must be willing to admit that sexual exploitation is a problem in this country, and we must strengthen our laws to better protect the most vulnerable in our communities. Research and statistics have time and time again shown us that young people and persons living with disabilities are more often than not the victims of sexual and other types of crime. According to Statistics Canada report, Victims of Police Reported Crime in Canada 2016, when controlling for population, the rate of victimization was highest among youth aged 16 to 17 and young adults aged 18 to 24. The report further explains, quote, overall, 8% of police reported victims were victims of sexual offenses. However, these offenses were much more prevalent among, young, or among child and youth victims that came to the attention of police. This report goes on to state that 34% more than, three more than one third of female victims of sexual offenses were aged only 12 to 17 years old. According to Statistics Canada report, Violent Victimization of Women Disabilities, it states, according to both self-reported and police reported data, the large majority of victims of sexual assault are women. This pattern is also evident when looking at the population with a disability who are victims of self-reported sexual assault as nearly nine in 10 victims were women. The report also states, Canadians with a disability, 30% of incidents, were more likely to be victimized in their own home compared with victims who do not have a disability. This serves to highlight the sad reality that even in their own home, people with a disability are at an increased vulnerability. According to the Department of Justice's Research and Statistics Division, Quote, sexual assault is a gendered crime. Women are victimized at a higher rate than men. As with other violent victimization, young people aged 15 to 24 years have the highest rates of sexual assault, 71 incidents per thousand population. Madam Speaker, sexual exploitation is a disturbing crime because it involves an imbalance and an abuse of power. Often it involves some sort of authority figure in a position of trust to the victim. That is why for years the criminal code has included the following description in the section for sexual exploitation. Every person who is in a position of trust or authority towards a young person or as a person with whom the young person is in a, repla in a relationship of dependency. Furthermore, it's clarified in the sexual exploitation of someone with a, of a person with disability, it reads similarly. Quote, every person who is in a position of trust or authority towards a person with a mental or physical disability or who is a person with whom a person with a mental or physical disability is in a relationship of dependency. This makes the specific crime of sexual exploitation all the more concerning. It requires a person in a position of power to take advantage of that power for their own appalling purposes. There is no excuse and there is no justification for these kinds of acts. These crimes occur when a person actively chooses to use their position to harm an innocent victim. Last month, I had the honor to meet virtually with representatives of Booth, a Boost Child and Youth Advocacy Centre, an organization who provides services to victims of these types of crimes from Toronto to Barrie to Peterborough. They've talked about how difficult it is for victims of vulnerable populations in the justice system. We need to ensure they are respected and supported. We need to ensure when victims come forward, they feel they are taken seriously. We need to ensure victims of these types of crimes have faith in the system and believe the devastating acts committed against them will not go unpunished. I recognize that introducing legislation that proposes to increase sentences may not be consistent with the direction of the current government, which is often taking the position that some mandatory minimums are not appropriate. I would like to address this issue. Charter challenges on mandatory minimum sentences are determinations if the sentence is, quote, 
grossly disproportionate, end quote. This is not the case with this bill. Given the abuse of power and the long-term impacts on victims, it should be clear to all of us that a one-year minimum sentence for sexual exploitation of a person under 18 years of age or a person with disability is proportionate to the serious crime. Sex crimes are different from many other crimes. This has been recognized in the, by successive governments for decades, including the current Liberal government. The current mandatory minimum sentence of 90 days for sexual exploitation of a young person has been in place since the current Liberal government came to office and they have chosen to keep that one in place. In fact, when the government introduced Bill C-22, their own backgrounder explicitly stated that they were not proposing to remove mandatory minimum sentences for sexual offences and listed them among other serious violent offences in which strict sentences remain in place. Furthermore, when the Justice Minister spoke in this House, he clearly stated sexual offences committed against children are committed by serious criminals and should be treated seriously. The same should be true of sexual offences committed against persons living with disabilities. Madam Speaker, it would be beneficial for Parliament, the elected branch of government, to explicitly include in the criminal code a higher sentence for these crimes for the purpose of protecting vulnerable Canadians. Criminal laws serve to protect vulnerable people and serve a valid purpose. They are a legitimate part of fostering a safe society and they serve the public good. In the last number of months, under the challenges of COVID-19, many Canadians have been distressed to hear of increasing reports of sexual crimes. On, October, or on July 13, 2020, a CBC News headline stated, child sex exploitation is on the rise in Canada during the pandemic. The article states, cybertip.ca saw an 81% spike over April, May and June 2020 in reports from youth who have been sexually exploited and reports of people trying to sexually abuse children. A global news report last month stated a man from outside of Edmonton was arrested and charged with multiple counts of exploitation, among other charges. And a March 20th, 2021 CBC News headline stated, reports of sexual violations against children double in PEI. I encourage all members of all parties to come together and support this bill. In fact, there is precedence for all party cooperation regarding changes to these sections of the criminal code. Prior to 2005, the maximum sentence for sexual exploitation of a young person as an indictable offence was only five years and no minimum sentence was provided. This change in the 38th Parliament, when the then Liberal minority government passed Bill C-2, an act to amend the criminal code, protection of children and other vulnerable persons, and the Canada Evidence Act, and was sponsored by then Justice Minister Erwin Kotler. That bill increased the maximum, maximum sentence for sexual exploitation of a young person to 10 years and introduced a minimum sentence of 14 days. The bill also added to the criminal code a list of factors regarding the nature and circumstance of the relations to be established to determine how the relationship is exploitative. As Minister Kotler told the Justice Committee at the time, the purposes of the bill were, quote, to, great, to provide greater protection to youth against sexual exploitation from persons who would prey on their vulnerability. This bill was not only supported by all parties, but its passage was accelerated by all party agreement and the use of an unanimous consent motions. Then on May 1, 2008, the criminal code was amended again through another bill also named C2, this time to change the definition of a young person and to provide additional protections. This bill, C2, the Tackling Violent Crime Act was sponsored by the then Justice Minister Rob Nicholson and passed quickly through the House of Commons with all party support and cooperation. I would note the support of this bill included the current Minister of Transport, the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations, the Government House Leader, Chief Government Whip, and the Liberal members for Ottawa South, Halifax West, Humber River Black Creek, Lac Saint Louis, and Costa Bay's Central Notre Dame. Madam Speaker, young people and persons living with disabilities need to be protected. It is incumbent on us to pass this bill because it is a targeted bill to correct two specific flaws in the criminal code. As parliamentarians, we have a duty to ensure the criminal code provides appropriate sentences for disturbing crimes so vulnerable Canadians are not at risk. There is no excuse for these crimes. Madam Speaker, I urge all my fellow members to support this important bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker.